Hey, and welcome back to the podcast. We are here with Don Moore from HybridTheory.com. Don is the president and CEO of Hybrid Theory North America. He's responsible for the overall strategy, operations, and business direction of the company in the region. And we are going to be talking today about how to oversee different personalities and work styles to drive campaigns. We are going to be talking about Don's experience as the CEO of a large organization and about CMOs and metrics and marketing and wherever we go. So Don, glad to be talking to you. Nice to be talking to you too. Thank you for having me. Super glad to have you. And so, you know, I am here to amplify you to get the word out about your message. So what the heck should we be paying attention to? What's the, what's the problem and what should we be knowing you for? Well, I, as you mentioned, I, I, I'm a marketing and sales person. Uh, I've been in the industry a long time. I probably don't want to say how long, uh, but uh, here at Hybrid Theory, which is my current stop, I, I oversee all the operations for our North American operations. And uh, what that means is it's really about digital media marketing is what, I, is what we do. We are one of those places, people that place for our clients and agencies um exceptional digital marketing pieces that you see and sometimes probably annoy you as you surf uh, through the internet day to day um, okay and so so digital marketing means a lot of things but what is your focus what has you the most excited when it comes to digital marketing uh probably the way we well i i guess these days it's the the balance between respecting the privacy of the consumers we try to reach on behalf of our clients and, and finding new and innovative ways to bring that relevant content to them. So we do a little bit of both. I mean, and, and, and it seems like every month there's new technology and new ways to do it with discipline and respect for the, for the clients that we serve and also for the consumers that we reach. So it's a, it's a fast moving industry. It really is. And, and every week it's a little something different. Yeah. And so can you give us a, a fun story of one of these uh, crazy different weeks and just to give us a, an idea of maybe what your week is like or what your company's focus on or just to kind of like give us a, a little bit of a quick story? I, I don't know if I have a story at the top of my head, but I, I know that every Sunday night I try to plot out my week. And it seems that every Friday night when I look back on what I was going to do, I've accomplished none of the things I said I set out the week to start with. But um, we, we've had, we, we do have a, a couple of clients in, in recent weeks, and I, I can't really name them by name, but I kid you not, and they have come up with no less than 10 changes to their marketing plans. And I don't mean just creative, but I'm talking about entire approaches and platforms. They want to do television, they want to do CTV, they want to do, or they want to do CTV, or they want to do video, they want to create a web series, they want to create all in one in the last 30 days. So this is really a nonstop, you know, kind of change. But we've got a great team here. Uh, I'm really honored to be a part of them. And, and, and they take these things in stride a lot better than I do sometimes. So, yeah. And so uh, what what has your evolution been like? Because you say that now, now you're you're here and you have this team and you plan out your day, but sometimes you're just all these these fires that, that get in the way. And it seemed like there was a little bit of, of subtext in there as far as like being patient with your client and, and going with the um, embracing the chaos, basically. So, I mean, what what sort of like imp like personal improvements have you picked up in the in those last couple of decades? Like, what were you like, you know, all those years ago and what kind of like mistakes have you learned from? Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, I get asked that question a lot and I think it's really about balance. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, when, when you do start out on your career, everything takes on an importance of, of, of almost epic magnitude about even the smallest things you do, especially if you want to do a great job. Um, and and that, that's the way it was for me. So everything was very emotionally vested at one point. I was emotionally vested in everything we do. But as time goes on, you, you see things repeat themselves. The patterns repeat themselves, the same things. Not the same mistakes because you learn from it, but you, you, you see people that would act the way you say that you used to 
that would be the same way you used to. And then here come the kids and here come the, the marriage and, and, and life intrudes and you realize to put these things in their place. So, you're, so my job now is at this point of my career is to really be a mentor and a teacher about work-life balance um, and to recognize that there'll always be clients that change your mind 30 times in a week. And there'll always be that mistake that happens at the last minute or somebody, some, uh, uh, the most conscientious person that is a part of the team will always end up one day making some kind of error or overlooking something. It happens. And it's not the end of the world. You have to keep that in balance. And remember the things that are really important are usually waiting for you after five o'clock or six o'clock or seven or eight o'clock, depending on when you decide to go home. Um, so just keep it in perspective. Uh, and, 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 you know, cherish your time off. You know, I, I tell everybody, I, I try to end every meeting with, you know, statement, your vacation, take it. I, I want to make sure they always, always realize that it's important to spend time away and go off the grid and recharge. So I, I, I think I, I, I try to bring that perspective a little bit more differently than, than the bosses I had when I was in my 20s. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I like that a lot. I like that, that, you know, you, you get the perspective over time, you understand those patterns. Uh, you know, it's, you're not always coming across a brand new situation. You're like, well, I've, I've seen this before. I've seen this personality type before. I've seen this problem before. And in the big picture, it, it's not so bad. So I like your, uh, your work life balance term, especially because uh, I don't know if, if you've come across, but it sometimes it, it gets kind of misused, right? This work-life balance kind of seems like an excuse to uh, kind of do do things halfway at work and then do things halfway at home. And uh, so, and it's it's I'm always interested in how to be like fully there, right? Like fully focused and fully energized. And sometimes in adulting, doing the things that you don't really feel like doing and then doing them anyway. And then when you're partway through it, you're like. I don't even know why I was, was stressing so much. So do you deal with any of that? Do you deal with saying like, oh, I have this full calendar or I have this, this family activities and I'd rather just, you know, sit at home on the couch and there needs to be a way to kind of energize and, and focus yourself. So what kind of secrets or insights about that can you share with us? Uh, you know, I, you always, after a full week, it always seems tempting to get that nap in the middle of the day or, or do a Netflix surf you know, at the end of the day, but those things will always be there. And my daughter just graduated from college uh, in uh, about three weeks ago. And, you know, I'll never get her zero to 21 years back. And now she's going to strike out her own and be in the same place I was many years ago. So, you know, when you, you could always find a way to, to rest and relax, but Real life and real events, you need to take advantage of when they're here. Yeah, that kid's sixth birthday party, boy, I just, I don't know. I would rather be anywhere on the planet. Well, you may think that, but when your daughter grades for, graduates from college, you'll look back and say, I wish I was at that six-year-old birthday party again. You know, it, it goes really fast. I'm not, not that I'm ancient or anything. I don't want to come across it that way or some wise Yoda type sage, but, um, you know, just keep pushing you can always take a moment to sit down. It'll, it'll be there. It'll be there. As for work, it, you know, I, tr there, there are a lot of distractions, more so than there used to be at work. You, you should try to take advantage of every minute that you can to focus on those things that are important. So there's less to do over on a Saturday or Sunday. There will be weekends that you have to do things. Just accept that as normative. One weekend a month, two weekends a month. I, I have gone months without taking a day off, but that can happen. Just don't make it the habit of your lifetime. So that's that's all I can say. But that, you know, the the it's funny about the work life balances. I uh, about a year ago, I went into a storage facility and opened up a box, and there were hundreds of photos in there. And I had them all digitized. And when you look back on that, that stuff, that's the real stuff that's important. Digitizing my kids when they were younger. So uh, that's the kind of stuff that's really, really important. And it, it'll make, by the way, that kind of stuff will make it be better at work, believe it or not. You'll see. It's hard to explain. It's not in a textbook. But when you feel good about the weekend you spend at a six-year-old birthday party, believe me, 
you'll, you'll laugh and joke. Your coworkers will roll their eyes. And, I've been there. I've done that. But you'll do better at work. I promise you. So because you feel better. I, I like that a lot. And, and I can under, I can get why that could give you the reason why, or you can feel like you kind of left, left it all out on the field, so to speak, like you gave your all in the personal life and there's not, nothing there left hanging. And uh, my son's two right now. And I hear so much of like, you know, the, these parents such as yourself, whose kids are in their twenties, thirties and older. And they just say like, man, the, the amount of money I would give for like one hour back in that period of time. And so I just, I try to soak it all up since, since that's my present right now. Yeah, I don't know about the two-year-old stage though. I, I, I probably wouldn't want to go back that to the two-year-old stage, but when they're your road park, when and I used to, my daughters used to be my road dog. You know, I'd strap them in the car. I'd go play golf at six in the morning, be back at noon, then strap them in the car and they'd run errands with me on, on a Saturday afternoon. Those times I'd take back because that was hysterical. They were fun. Two years old, that's a tough age. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fun age. That's, that's a fun age. It's inter- they get interesting at that point. They're turning into little people. And it's really funny. It's, I'm sure you laugh all the time. So Oh, oh yeah. Every day. And, and so does he. And with the, with the parenting and with the working from home and with the pandemic, uh, I'm definitely experiencing the, the lack of weekends or reduced weekends. And then sometimes just jumping in for 15 minutes just to make like a little bit of progress or to just okay. see where things are at or just chip away. So that way it's not this huge overwhelming thing uh, later on like you're talking about. And it reminds me of like when I was an immature kid, when I was a teenager, when I was in high school, I would leave assignments until the very last minute. And it was just like so stressful. And looking back on it now, I'm thinking like, why, why did it, why did I put myself through that? But why did like every, every kid in America do that? Right. Every teenager, every high schooler just waits till the very last second. And it's like, you know, if you just put in 15 minutes every day until that assignment's due, then the day before you might only have to put in like 10 minutes. So I, I like that, that mindset. And I've been embracing that more than anything else these days with like the limited time, just jumping in for just a quick 15 minutes, just to chip away at something. And, it, and, and what will happen is when you do it, and I do that too, and that uh, you have to be able to keep that running tally of where everything is in your head so you don't forget something. But just remember, you think you can put together that presentation in four hours. You know, I always multiply that by six or seven because it, you know, just to give myself enough time to think and pontificate over it, change this and that, because it takes twice as long, three times as long as you think it might take. You know, so yeah, don't rush it. You know, start on it two weeks early. What does it hurt to do a slide and then go back and change it? You got time. You'll still be working that last, you'll still be crunching that last four or five hours, but that's when, you know, you, you put enough work in that it's tight. You know, it's really tight, you know, and, and it's better than you would have done if you had rushed it. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, yeah, you're, you're being like optimistically pessimistic or maybe pessimistically optimistic. One, one of the two, but you're, you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, it, I guess it works either way, right? When you, when you say like, I know it will take longer than I expect. So I'm kind of hedging my bets ahead of time and, and doing, you know, doing what I should do before it's at the very end of, of the clock. And so uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of things we, we've been talking about so far, but what's kind of your your big idea or like, what's like your, your big picture? Because if, if you're Mr. CEO, you got to be like taking on big jobs, big tasks, thinking about big things. So is there any like, just something huge, massive, and epic that's been on your mind lately? Growing the business here in the States uh, and in Canada uh, has been on my mind. And just, uh, I try to offer, at this role, I, I, I come up with ideas and, and partnerships and, and potential clients and, you know, holding fast to the to the real strategic platform of where we're headed and let the team do their work. We built a nice team here and, you know, you have to trust them to, to, to move things forward. I give them every thing that I can give them in terms of, uh, of, um, you know, support, uh, so that they can move forward. And then I come up with ideas, some of them good, some of them bad. Some of them, they're way too polite to tell me, Oh, that's interesting, which really means that idea sucks and we're not doing it. So they know better than I do. And um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to really increase the size of this business and the service that we give to our clients. And that's what really has been on my mind, you know, every day, every, 
you know, I can do it with a golf club in my hand or I can do it when I'm starting the dishwasher, but I'm always thinking about it, you know, or at least for the most part, I'm thinking about it. So what specific ideas? Now that I can't tell you, and, you know, okay. but, uh, but uh, it is, and how we go about it with the support of our team over in the UK uh, is, is, is something that occupies my mind daily. Yeah. Well, good. It's good to have a, a top secret project. So that, that way it feels exclusive or, and unique to you. Or projects with an S yes. on the end. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, like I say, I guarantee you a couple of them are just going to be really bad ideas or fail miserably. You, know, you just need to get one or two across the finish line that make a difference. And you got to figure right. out what those are. Yeah. yeah. You, you can have five, 10, 20 failed. If you have that, that one that, that succeeds, that's all you need. And that's exactly what I do. <laughs> it's just like starting a project early. You, you know, the more have chance you have and the more opportunities you have to tinker around with stuff, the better. You know, you'll eventually find the one that works. And that's what we try to do. Yeah. Yeah. And because uh, the, the wife, for some reason, the wife and me last night, we were kind of getting on this topic of like these these different brands. And we saw a photo of a 7-Eleven and there was a sign out front and like the logo of 7-Eleven, she noticed, hasn't changed in decades. And then it got us on this whole tangent of talking about, you know, like uh, like Taco Bell messes with their menu item and McDonald's comes out with the, the McRib. And there's just like all these just kind of like experiments that you see businesses doing with, with the food and the fast food, it's fun because like you see those all the time and it's kind of, it's more exciting than like a clothing brand, but like you see all the, all of these, you know, Burger King or, or so, someone is always just innovating and just trying out these little experiments and it kind of gets them some buzz, gets some, some attention. And usually it's a complete and total failure and they pull it off the menu. But in the meantime, they're holding out for uh, that, that one thing that, really succeeds. And even if it kind of fizzles out, if it's kind of a dud, it's still bringing in the customers. It's, it's still marketing for them, even though it's kind of a failure in a way. Yeah, very true. I mean, is it, there's no, there was, um, when I started out my career at Johnson & Johnson, there, you know, they had a chairman at that point who, who instilled in you a lack of fear of failure. He said, if you're not trying new ideas, we're never going to grow. So I, I learned that early on that you don't always have to succeed if you can fail, you know, over and over again, just keep your eye on how expensive those failures are. But I mean, you know, there, there are plenty of precursors to success um, that were, were born of failure and some things that are that have their time. You know, there were there were dozens of, of, of uh, applicants to the throne of the iPad before there was the iPad. And, you know, there was Betamax before there was VHS. So there's plenty of applicants for the title and now there's no VHS. So you, 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 you should try. If you don't try, you're not doing your job. You should be, you should be flogged at daylight <laughs> you know, for not doing your job. Yeah, very true. And you always hear about, you know, th things like a, like 80, 20 or like a loss leader. And as long as you have, you know, the, the, your mainstays that are making you money, and then you have all these little experiments on the periphery that maybe those are failing over and over. Like you said, as long as it's not too costly, it's totally okay. Yeah. Everything has a life cycle though. And it doesn't matter. You know, you, you may feel in your heart that Google will be around forever, but it won't. And you may feel like at one point Ford felt invincible. And so did General Motors. And they obviously became not invincible. Sears felt invincible. I know I'm from Chicago. They were invincible. The tallest building or one of the tallest buildings in Chicago was named after that company. It's no longer named after that company. They were invincible. Everything has a life cycle. Everything eventually will decline. Um, Apple too, although right now they're on a roll. Uh, Netflix, oh my gosh, the unstoppable juggernaut suddenly has a hiccup and their stock just plummets. Well, it's normal. Is it permanent? Well, we'll see. Uh, but uh, in, in digital, life cycles are shorter, you know, by and away than they have been. So yes, while you're planning, while you believe there are the mainstays of your portfolio and product that have a life cycle, you must always prepare for the inevitability of decline because they will eventually fall. You know, they must. It's just natural law of things. And uh, you're reminding me of 
a few years ago, I found some web page that they looked at all these websites from 20 years ago and they showed like New York Times front page, Amazon, and they look like the most like, piece of garbage websites, but it just goes to show like how much things have changed and how these life cycles have happened. But you don't realize it because you're going through the gradual day to day and you don't realize like, oh man, I stopped using Alta Vista or Excite how many years ago? Just, but you didn't notice because there was that one day when you didn't log into MySpace anymore or you didn't fire up Napster anymore. But then you look back at the years and it's just, it's so drastic. And so um, as we're beginning to wind down our conversation here, Don, I want to make sure we fit in here a little bit of room for like a, a little bit of a failure story, because we've talked about some other stories and talked about failures, but like solving the problems or maybe even like the, the difficulties you've been having growing this company, like what comes to mind as far as just the, the obstacles, the struggles you've been coming up against lately? Lately? Um, I don't think any of us ever have managed to cope. There's not been a COVID. You know, and so coming out the other side, I mean, suddenly, you know, we have offices that today are basically empty today. You know, um, and there's only a few, a few people here. This is, this, is, this is the obstacle that I'm having. You hear about the great resignation. You hear about uh, uh, the hot job market at the same time. It's the great resignation in terms of work. This is the struggle I'm having. Talent, where are they? Are they, you know, can we afford? We, we need great people to grow. We need great people to see tomorrow, to, to offer those ideas that succeed and fail. And, and COVID has it, it, it changed the rules. It seems almost surreal how we all behaved just two years ago. Your, your, your son, I believe son is what you said, was, was, was probably born inside of COVID. You know what I mean? During that time, I'll, Wow, you know, that's a mind blower right there. I was worried I wouldn't be able to see him born. I was worried they wouldn't let me in the hospital. Fair, and that's a fair concern. Um, and, uh, you know, so now that that is the, you, you couple that with a global insecurity over the economy and we don't know what tomorrow, I mean, I've managed through recessions, I've managed through inflations, I've managed through, you know, stagflation, made up terms like well they were really made up terms but they were real terms but i've never married married uh, managed through a post covid uh, inflation recession i have no idea what it's going to look like in terms of what our clients need our, our clients need and what they want so and also the the reevaluation of the needs of talent these days and, and what people really want from their their job is it enough is it too much, you know? I mean, is, is working from home permanent? I saw today Elon Musk has said, if you don't come in the office four or five days a week, I'll assume you don't wanna be here or something to that effect. So, I mean, I don't know how well that's gonna go. I, for him, it's maybe a different animal, but I mean, how do we manage through? That's my biggest biggest hurdle, you know? It, it, it's, it's getting back to whatever that sense of normal is post COVID and how long will it be here? Yeah. That's so something. you're saying there's a, a lot of uncertainty and you've dealt with these periods of uncertainty, but but nothing quite as, as unknown and, and new as this. Economic uncertainty, sure. I married, I, I, I managed, I've said that twice. I've uh, managed through eras of great boom, like the beginning of the dot-com era where you thought you were a genius because there was so much money being thrown around and so, without discipline you thought wow look at my business grow and you were doing nothing to deserve this it just happened there was all this money because everybody was trying to find you know the next big dot com you know pets.com throwing around money left and right back in those days um but never anything coming on the kind of sea change in in expectation in in satisfaction evaluation and needs of of, of talent and the economy post COVID. We are a much more mobile economy. You know, the brick and mortar is under assault. Everything has changed. Um, it accelerated every trend by I say at least five to seven years. Um, it's now normative to see uh, delivery on the streets, not in just in New York, but in middle America. It's normative to see that. Uh, it is normative for most people to get their goods and services delivered by 
fill in the blank it usually sound is usually filled in with amazon but it's, it's normative not the exception not 30 percent of the cases is normative how do we respond to that kind of uncertainty and permanence in our business you know what and mobility for physicians is normative now getting counsel from physicians over the over your computer normative unthinkable a few years ago everybody wants to go to see doesn't want to go see the doctor but they will uh because they have to so uh, that's it it's a challenge it's fun it's interesting it changes every day so well i, I like your attitude and you say how do we respond to this and and it's not an easy answer is it it's it's a different response based on each case by case yeah think about this there's no textbook for this is there there's a textbook for managing uh, X business or X type of business through recession, inflation, permutations of both. There is no textbook written on how to handle even the existing employees post COVID. Some are suffering through their own personal rebuilding inside their head post COVID still. And, but there are a few, I mean, there are articles here and there, but those are young articles. Are not the ones that you go to as the as the as the, you know definitive text on X and Y. So all that's being rewritten right now. And well, since, since there's no textbook, I can tell that you're a, a thinker. You're someone that kind of sits and um, like mulls things over and, and revisits. And I think that thinking is a really underrated skill because you can't really put a can't really put an exact you know method on it, right? Just like sitting and and solving the problems. And this was even a, an issue that was only brought to my attention like a year or two ago when I said, well, am I, you know, implementing this right? And do I, am I strategizing this right? And the person said, no, you just, you just need to think about what it is that you're doing more. And even like, you know, you were saying how there's these cycles and, you know, if real estate blows up just because someone happened to be lucky or cryptocurrency blows up, that person thinks they're so smart. It's like, well, no, you were just gambling. You weren't, you weren't thinking about it. So just from our conversation and like kind of getting into your thought process, the lesson I'm getting is, how important it is to just sit there and think about, well, about the future, about my people, about their problems, about my responses, about where I'm at. Just thinking is a thing that we all need to be doing more of. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great. hundred percent. Well, well, cool. Well, we've been having a nice conversation here and I want to make sure that we plug hybrid theory and tell people really quick in these last few minutes about what you're all about. So hybrid theory, it's not for everyone, but who is it for and what's the sales pitch? We, we, we build custom audiences based on proprietary intelligence. What that means is if you, if you are a business, either a client or an agency, um, we build custom audiences uh, that better address your needs of how to reach uh, these, these, your, your end consumer places you may never have been before incremental business. You may never have seen, and we're the ones that have it and probably do it better than anybody else in the industry. But in addition to that, we do run, we can run and have put together hundreds of thousands of digital marketing campaigns, not just for the Fords of the world or the McDonald's, as you mentioned of the world, but we, we specialize in helping those small to medium sized businesses. Um, that don't have access to the big, big, big box, the hundreds of millions or tens of billions of dollars that's going in the media. We're, we're the ones that really help them. And, and, and that's really the, the part that is really America. You know, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, run by the mega corporations. It's, it's the business on the corner that has half a million or, or, or 200 or 100,000 for their own marketing budget, perhaps even less. And we're there to help. Uh, with technologies that you normally can't find that are reserved for those really huge clients. And that's where we found our niche. And we're, we're glad to serve that way. So how can someone uh, reach out to you and your agency and make contact? Um, HybridTheory.com is a good way to start. Uh, you can even, if you if you have a story you want to share on there, maybe what you need. Uh, we have a sales team that can be contacted on that website uh, at any time or Hybrid Theory New York. Uh, is another way to do it. But we're always here. We try to answer just about everyone. As you might imagine, we get many a day uh, looking and, and it, it very much depends. We always try to ask the question, as opposed to taking money, can we really help you? You know, and uh, uh, that's the thing that we, we, we try to do. Sometimes it's, you know, just not 
enough scale or, 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 or size of, of the campaign, we can steer you in directions. And sometimes other parts of our business or sometimes even competitors that do better. But we, you know, we, we're not picky. I mean, it's not saying we're overly picky and we only accept this and this and this. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's that we want to make sure that you succeed. And if we're not the best choice for that, we'll let you know. Yeah. Well, fabulous. So it's, it sounds like the, the time is now for if someone is watching or listening and they are that right size of business and they want to have your team help build those custom audiences, if they're tired of the way things have, have been going, if they need uh, to do better moving forward in the future with, with all these uncertainties and all these things going on, then the place to go right now is hybridtheory.com and contact Don and his company, get that conversation started, see if you're a right fit, see if they can solve those problems, the ones that you know about and the ones that you don't know about, hybridtheory.com. And any final parting words of advice here, Don, as we wrap up our conversation? No, I, I wish I did have some pearls of wisdom to drop on you. It'd be a great time for it. But I, I do want to thank you for taking the time and having me if, uh, on the show. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate you too. I'm doing the big picture stuff, right? Having the important conversations. Ah, <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. You have a great day. All you right. as well. And, and those podcast listeners out there, you have a great day over at hybridtheory.com. We will see you there.